launch director. Launch vehicle. It's ready to launch. We have ignition. ignition. You have permission Two. to launch. One. And liftoff. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. Mark one. Execute. And we have an indication of spacecraft separation. At Space Launch Complex 41, an Atlas V rocket is fueled and ready to launch AEHF-4, the fourth advanced extremely high-frequency satellite for the United States Air Force. Good evening and welcome to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. I'm Tyler Strickland, a trajectory engineer from ULA's mission design team. I'm coming to you live from Mission Control in the Atlas Spaceflight Operations Center. Currently, the team is not working any issues, and we are proceeding in the count towards liftoff at 12.15 a.m. Eastern. A few seconds from now, the count will enter a planned 15-minute hold. There are two planned holds in our nearly seven-hour launch count. The planned holds give our team additional time to resolve any issues prior to entering the terminal count. Jessica Williams, the 45th Space Wing's weather officer, recently briefed the launch team on current weather conditions here at Cape Canaveral. The probability of violating launch constraints is 0%. The ground winds are 13 knots out of the southeast, and the temperature is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather is within the launch commit criteria and looks favorable for the planned T0 of 1215 AM Eastern. Because of the long duration of today's mission, live coverage will conclude following the second main engine cutoff. We will now show you some of the events you will see between liftoff and AEHF-4 separation. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, we have ignition, 2, 1, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V. Rocket. The Atlas V RD-180 main engine and five solid rocket boosters ignite to lift the rocket away from the pad. The RD-180 generates more than 860,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff. The five solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, each provide an additional 348,500 pounds of thrust. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 35 seconds. The first two SRBs are jettisoned at 1 minute 51 seconds, followed a second and a half later by the remaining three SRBs. Approaching payload fairing jettison, the Atlas V is burning propellant at a rate of 2,000 pounds per second, traveling approximately 7,500 miles per hour, and located 64 miles in altitude and 150 miles downrange. During ascent, the spacecraft is protected inside the 5-meter diameter payload fairing. This two-piece shell encapsulates both the Centaur second stage and the satellite. At approximately 3 minutes 29 seconds, the vehicle is climbed above the densest part of Earth's atmosphere and the payload fairing is jettisoned. At 4 minutes 27 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the main engine shuts down. Six seconds later, the Atlas Centaur separation system activates to release the booster stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 7% of what it did at liftoff. At 4 minutes 43 seconds, the first Centaur main engine burn begins, sending the Centaur into a circular orbit. At 11 minutes 51 seconds, cutoff of the Centaur main engine, or MECO-1, occurs. The Centaur main engine is restarted for a second burn at 22 minutes 25 seconds, placing Centaur on its path to spacecraft separation. Approximately six minutes later, second cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs. The mission now enters a three-hour coast phase. The main engine ignites for a third and final burn at three hours 28 minutes. At three hours 30 minutes, the final main engine cutoff occurs. Three hours, 32 minutes, 49 seconds into flight, Centaur releases the United States Air Force AEHF-4 on its mission to provide communications to high-priority military users on the ground, at sea, and in the air. ULA is using the Atlas V 551 configuration to launch AEHF-4. This is the 79th Atlas V launch in the 131st ULA mission. Produced in Decatur, Alabama, the Atlas V 551 is the largest and most powerful configuration in the Atlas V fleet. 
It is comprised of a common core booster powered by an RD-180 engine, five Aerojet Rocketdyne solid rocket boosters, and a Centaur second stage powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10C1 engine. The AEHF-4 payload is protected during ascent by a Ruag 5 meter diameter payload fairing. On October 5th, the encapsulated payload was transported to the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, at Space Launch Complex 41, where it was mated to the Atlas V rocket. The launch countdown begins with moving the rocket from the VIF to the pad. At approximately 10.30 a.m. Monday, the quarter-mile trip began using six components to complete the 20-minute trip. Weighing in at about 2 million pounds, the Mobile Launch Platform, or MLP, supports the rocket and contains air conditioning, electrical, and commodities, while the undercarriages bear the weight of the MLP and rocket. Two rail cars lead the move with the payload van, providing communication to the payload while the ground van houses the ground support for the rocket. At the rear of the convoy, the portable environmental control system provides air conditioning to the payload and rocket. Finally, trackmobiles provide the power to move the 3.5 million pound convoy. Convoy. A third trackmobile is added to the front of the convoy to move our largest Atlas V configuration. Boosters produce approximately 2.5 million pounds of thrust to lift the rocket off the pad and begin its journey to orbit. As I mentioned earlier, Atlas V is launching the fourth satellite in the Air Force's advanced EHF constellation. Atlas V launch vehicles have delivered AEHF-1, 2, and 3 to orbit beginning in 2010. The AEHF constellation is the next generation of global, high-security, survivable communication satellites used by all branches of the United States military. AEHF satellites are the follow-on to the Department of Defense's current five-satellite Milstar communications constellation. Once fully operational, the advanced EHF constellation will consist of cross-linked satellites, providing 10 times the throughput of the Milstar system with a substantial increase in coverage to users. This morning's mission has a number of exciting milestones. We will begin by hearing from the commander of the 45th Space Wing, Brigadier General Chess, to discuss ULA's 50th launch for the United States Air Force. Then, Major Matthew Getz will be joining me to dive into the capabilities AEHF will provide. We will also see my interview with Marty Malinowski, the Atlas V Chief Engineer, talking about today's 250th flight of the Centaur Upper Stage, followed by Lori O'Donnelly to fill us in on the role Lockheed Martin played in this mission. Stay tuned after Main Engine Start 2, because Major Getz and I will be returning to host a game of trivia on Twitter, featuring questions about ULA launch history. Here's how this works. A few minutes after launch, questions will be posted to ULA's Twitter account, and the first person to comment on the question with the correct answer will receive a prize. Answers and winners will be announced shortly before we sign off. Following today's broadcast, check out ULA's new live uh, launch updates blog at ulalaunch.com, where you will find official and timely information regarding the AEHF-4 mission. The artwork on the payload fairing of today's Atlas V rocket consists of a flag in each corner representing the countries involved with AEHF, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the Netherlands. The three stars at the bottom represent spacecrafts one through three, with a larger star coming over the horizon to represent this fourth AEHF launch. This morning's flight is dedicated in memory of our colleague, friend, and patriot, Fred Smeagol. Fred, an accomplished engineer, was an amazing logical thinker. He had a significant depth of knowledge in many areas, including avionics packaging, stress, dynamics, and how to test anything. Fred was well known and greatly trusted in the customer community, a testament to his knowledge, but more importantly, to his character. Fred was a caring, happy, fun, and humorous individual dedicated to his career and especially his family and friends. He used his artistic ability to volunteer for ULA events and had a booming laugh that could brighten the entire team. Well respected and loved across ULA, 
Fred was always willing to lend a hand or teach someone something new. Fred loved launching rockets and was the consummate rocket scientist and he will be missed across the launch community where he left an amazing legacy. Shortly after MLP rolled to pad, we had the opportunity to hear from Brigadier General Chess, commander of the 45th Space Wing. Let's take a look. First off, I want to say how excited I am to be back at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station as the 45th Space Wing commander. From 2012 to 2014, I had the pleasure of being the operations group commander. So I'm no stranger to the hardware we have behind us and the great partnership we have with ULA. This upcoming launch of Advanced DHF-4 marks a critical part in the Air Force's Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle program. ULA has uh, been a great part of that program that's had 100 launches today, but this is the 50th launch for ULA. And this brings an incredible partnership together to be able to bring national security space to the warfighter downrange. And that's what Advanced CHF-4 does for us. It brings protected military satellite communications to the warfighter, and we we need that, and this is a great partnership. So with that, I'd like to say thanks to ULA for their partnership with us. Thanks to the 45th Space Wing for the commitment and dedication to assured access to space, because we know control of the battlefield begins right here. L minus eight minutes. We remain in the planned 15 minute built in hold as we continue to prepare for liftoff. In a few moments, launch conductor Ed Kitta will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 29 engineers and managers will be pulled for system status in readiness to proceed with the launch. This is the final status check before launch for all Atlas vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The readiness poll includes hydraulics, pad water deluge system, electrical systems, pneumatics, propulsion, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as launch conductor Ed Kitta performs the final polling of the team. L oh, minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count, Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. LD is go. The launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC verify T0 is set for 04 colon 15 Zulu. Verified. Polling is complete and the launch team has given the go for launch. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be listening to launch conductor Ed Kitta and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. You will hear the team call out that Atlas LO2 topping has been secured, followed about a minute later by the call out for transferring the Atlas and Centaur stages from ground facility power to internal battery power. At T minus one minute and 55 seconds, the team will command the launch sequencer to start, followed shortly by securing the Centaur LH2 and LO2 topping activity. 
At T minus one minute and 40 seconds, the team will command the flight control system to launch enable and arm the flight termination system. In the final minute, the Atlas tanks will be verified at flight pressures, followed by verification of Centaur tank pressures. A final status check of Atlas, Centaur, and AEHF-4 readiness is connect conducted at T-25 seconds. At T-3 seconds, the RD-180 engine will roar to life. After liftoff, you'll hear the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent data. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. On my mark, the time will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. 355. Ground pyros enabled. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 12.15 a.m. Eastern. Three minutes. Atlas tanks to flight pressure. Carrying LO2 topping. 250. FTS internal. One fifty nine. Vehicle internal. One fifty five. On sequence start. One fifty. Securing Centaur LH two. Securing Centaur LH two. One forty. Launch enabled. One thirty seven. T minus 90 seconds. FTS the launch arm. vehicle payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. 120. OCU's armed. SVF count started. 115. Reduce ECS for launch. Roger. 110. Pent valves locked. T minus one minute. one minute. Rock report range status. Range green. Forty. Stable at step three. Twenty-eight. ECS reduced for launch. Roger. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go AHF four. T minus. T minus. Ten. Nine. Eight. 
seven, six, five, four, three. We have ignition, two, one, and liftoff of the AEHF-4 mission carried by United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket for the United States Air Force. Now 20 seconds in the flight. He is going to close with control. You are hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle Now passing 30 seconds in the flight. Mach 1, Atlas 5 now supersonic. Now passing 40 seconds in the flight. Experiencing a uh, telemetry dropout in the uh, Denver data station. At this point in the flight, RD-180 should be throttling back up to 100% thrust, passing through max Q. Now passing one minute into flight. Commentators, ESC, I can take over. Go ahead. We have continued to stop right normally during the set. Back to 100% thrust as expected. And VSC, I have data now. Back to you. Now, 1 minute, 25 seconds into flight, Atlas V rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 6,900 pounds per second. Now, 1 minute, 34 seconds into flight. And we have burnout on all five SRBs. RD-180 throttling back up to full thrust, 1 minute, 45 seconds into flight. One minute, 50 seconds in. And we have jettison of all five solid rocket boosters. Now passing two minutes into flight. Vehicle is now on cruise loop steering. And vehicle is now passing Mach 5. Now two minutes, 10 seconds into flight. RD-180 pump speeds and injector pressures look good in the uh, full thrust mode. Now 2 minutes, 25 seconds in, approximately 2 minutes remaining in the Atlas booster phase of flight. Launch vehicle is now 42 miles in altitude, 81 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,800 miles per hour. 2 minutes, 40 seconds into flight. And RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a 2.5G acceleration limit. Engine response and vehicle acceleration response looks good. Centaur reactor. Control system is now pressurizing the flight levels. Two minutes, 57 seconds in. Now three minutes into flight. Atlas V is now 63 miles in altitude, 137 miles downrange distance, traveling at 7,500 miles per hour. And pump speeds and injector pressures on the RD-180 look good as they're, as they're uh, throttling to maintain that 2.5. G acceleration limit. Approximately one minute remaining to BECO. Standing by for payload fairing jettison. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison. And we have CFLR jettison. Now three minutes, 40 seconds into flight. Vehicle now throttling to 95% thrust. And main engine now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6 G acceleration limit. Now passing four minutes into flight, and we have sent our boost phase chill down. Approximately 20 seconds remaining till BECO. Pump speeds and injector pressures on the RD-180 continue to look good as they're throttling to maintain the acceleration limit. 10 seconds remaining to BECO. Standing by for BECO. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage separation. And we have good indication of stage separation. We have pre-start on the RL-10. Standing by for ignition. And we have
we have ignition on the RL10. Chamber pressure looks good. Vehicle body rate response looks good. This is the first burn of today's mission. This first burn should last approximately six minutes. RL10 appears to be performing well. Chamber pressure looks good. Vehicle body rates uh, also looking good. Now passing five minutes, 10 seconds into flight. And five minutes, 25 seconds into flight. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus five and a half minutes. Patrick Moore just confirmed the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight and all systems continue to operate nominally. The mission is currently in the first of two Centaur engine burns. Our next event, Centaur main engine cutoff, will occur in approximately seven minutes. I'm joined now by Major Matthew Getz from the U.S. Air Force's Space and Missile Systems Center. Major Getz, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Glad to be here, Tyler. So, a great liftoff of the fourth satellite in the AEHF constellation. How do you feel? It feels great. You know, this is a major milestone for the Air Force and a big win for the United States and our international partners. Uh, so on behalf of Team SMC, I'd like to thank our industry partners, specifically Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and the United Launch Alliance. Uh, now, I, I mentioned earlier uh, when we were looking at the payload fairing logo, a few of the international partners. Uh, who are they and what do they do? So we currently have three international partners on the program. Uh, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Canada, and we're currently in negotiations with Australia's uh, Department of Defense so that we can onboard them as a fourth. In line with the Secretary of Defense and his guidance, the Air Force is actively um, uh, working to build more partnerships with our allies around the world. Uh, this really improves interoperability and makes us a more lethal combined fighting force. That's certainly a lot of capability, and uh, I touched on that earlier in the broadcast. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about AEHF's mission? Sure. So the mission of Advanced EHF is to provide survivable, protected communication for the military's high-priority assets on the ground, at sea, and in air. It also enables the President of the United States and combatant commanders to control their tactical and strategic forces uh, through all levels of war and at uh, all phases of conflict. And with all that capability, what exactly is the coverage of the AEHF constellation? So AEHF-4 that we just launched off the ground will complete the fully operational constellation for AEHF, and that will provide continuous coverage between 65 degrees north latitude and 65 degrees south. Okay, and uh, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, you mentioned some other satellites that might be on the way. Uh, you know, when would that one, when's the next AEHF going to be launching? Correct. So we've procured two additional satellites and the next one, AEHF-5, uh, we're currently projecting to see that lift off next July in 2019. Well, now that we've discussed the satellite and its capabilities, uh, can we hear a little bit more about yourself and your background and how you got involved with the AEHF team? Sure. So I'm a program manager. I've been in the Air Force for just over 10 years, active duty, and uh, I've been on the AEHF program for about two years. In my current role, I am responsible for assembly, test, and launch operations. Well, fantastic. And um, thank you so much for teaching us more about the AEHF mission. Um, you must be really proud today. Absolutely. Also, uh, we recognize that this is the 50th mission for the U.S. Air Force on the Atlas and the 250th launch overall for the upper stage Centaur. And I just want to say the Air Force is very uh, proud to be a part of this heritage and thankful for the hard work uh, between the Air Force and our industry partners. Well, thank you again. And I'll return with Major Getz later, uh, closer to Miko 2, to an announce the answers to our Twitter questions, um, as well as the winners. So uh, we are now approaching the Now passing 9 minutes, 30 seconds into flight.
ran approximately two minutes now remaining until Miko. And Centaur propellant utilization system continuing to uh, control MR as expected. RL10 chamber pressure continues to look good. And just over one minute now remaining until Miko. Now passing 11 minutes, 15 seconds into flight. RL-10 continuing to perform well. Chamber pressure looks good. Now 11 minutes, 30 seconds into flight, and we have IAP vanish. Launch vehicle is now orbital. And standing by for Miko momentarily. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Sent our body rates uh, damping out nicely from the shutdown transients. Uh, now seeing uh, RCS thruster activity as expected to uh, maintain vehicle control. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus 12 minutes, 22 seconds and counting. Patrick Moore just confirmed the first Centaur main engine cutoff. Our next event, main engine burn number two, will occur in approximately 10 minutes. And Centaur is now turning to the mess two attitude as expected. The 250th Centaur is carrying AEHF-4 to orbit. Let's see what Atlas V Chief Engineer Marty Malinowski had to tell us about this amazing launch capability. Marty, I know you're busy. We're still going through pad roll operations right now, so I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me today. Um, we're preparing to launch the 250th Centaur. Um, can you tell me a little bit about why it's been such an, a successful upper stage? Uh, well, Centaur, being uh, fueled by oxygen and hydrogen, has got one of the is the best mass fraction in the business as far as upper stages go. And with the high ISP of the RL10 engine, that's kind of think of that as your fuel economy. So you're able to burn that propellant in a very efficient manner. And uh, to date, there are no other upper stages out there that can can match it. So you mentioned the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So what kind of steps do we go through on day of launch to, to fill up the engine? Um, well, uh, today, right now, we're tanking RP-1, but tomorrow as we get into the launch countdown, we'll oxygen, we'll start tanking of the fuel. Fuel, of course, is only like 40 degrees above absolute zero, so very, very cold when we talk about cryogenic propellants. As a trajectory engineer, I can really appreciate that the Centaur has the ability to do multiple engine restarts uh, throughout a mission. Um, what about the Centaur uh, allows this to be possible? Well, the RL-10 engine, um, being an expand recycle engine, uh, basically gets its power from the uh, boiling of the liquid hydrogen once it comes in contact with the fuel chamber. And uh, the heat in the chamber basically turns into steam that turns a turbine. So it's 
kind of got its own built-in power source, and as far as ignition, it's an electrical spark type ignition, so the uh, stage can be real multiple times. That was proved out on uh, Titan Centaur number five. They actually burned seven different times on that mission, basically to test the capability to restart that Centaur in orbit. So you mentioned Titan Centaur five. You know, we've been launching Centaurs for a long time as ULA, but it's been around even longer than that. I think the number for today's launch is 250. How many of those Centaur launches do you uh, think you've been a part of? Oh, my first launch was AC-68R um, back in 1988, so I'd guess it's probably on the order of 150 or so. Wow. So, yeah, there's been quite a few of them. <laughs> uh, and, and that's been a lot of launches you've been a part of, and are there any of those that kind of stick out to you that are really memorable when it comes to thinking back on this? Uh, absolutely. The uh, Pluto New Horizons mission was extremely interesting, not only for the science objective that they're trying to perform, but the fact that we also had to integrate a third stage on top of Centaur. So that's um, a unique feat that we hadn't done before. Um, there are a couple other missions that I thought demonstrated how well our analysts really understand how the Centaur performs. Um, that might be the LROL cross mission and RBSP, uh, Radiation Belt Storm Probe mission. They used basically uh, all the capabilities in our Centaur in terms of being able to fly zero-g coasts to raise and lower our orbits to do some insertion of multiple spacecraft that we had never done before. And when it was all said and done, it worked perfectly. So I hear you're quite the historian when it comes to Centaur. Can you tell me more about its origin? Um, yeah, actually, the gentlemen that I started working for back in the day um, were some of the, the people that did that early design development of Centaur, and that work began probably in 1958 or so. There was at General Dynamics Astronautics Division, they had two teams competing to build an upper stage. One was the Centaur, the other one was called Vega. And the Vega team was paired up with Pratt Whitney building the precursor for today's RL-10, and the Centaur was actually working with General Electric. And, uh, NASA ended up looking at all the proposals and decided they liked the Pratt Whitney RL-10 version of the engine best and they liked the Centaur, so they married the two together and that became our configuration. But the uh, other interesting aspect of that too is the reason Pratt Whitney's engine was so far ahead was they had experience going back to perhaps 1956 or so on a classified program called Suntan that was to replace the uh, U-2 spy plane with a liquid hydrogen powered turbojet engine. So they had to develop the fuel pump that ultimately became the pump for the RL-10 to feed hydrogen to the turbojet for the uh, Suntan mission. Marty, thanks again for taking some time uh, to talk with us today. We'll let you get back to your uh, busy schedule and your roll to pad operations. All right, well, thank you. I'm joined now by Lori O'Donnelly from Lockheed Martin Communications. Uh, Lori, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. So we talked a little bit earlier about the artwork and the international partners. Uh, can you tell me who are the industry partners? How many are there and who are they? Sure. So there's three major partners for this advanced DHF mission. The Air Force, Northrop Grumman, and of course, Lockheed Martin. So the Air Force is Lockheed Martin's customer, and we're fortunate to work these really exciting missions with SMC, and we work really closely with the Air Force as a customer. Um, Northrop Grumman is the payload provider, and Lockheed Martin, we develop and build the satellite and the ground system out of our Sunnyvale, California campus. So all of us together, and then of course you saw ULA, they put the sat satellite into orbit on the Atlas V rocket. Well, it's certainly uh, quite a team effort. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, your team in California? So Lockheed Martin has been in the Bay Area since the early days of Silicon Valley, and now there are over 4,000 employees who are out there 
they design and they build the satellites for missions such as AEHF and Space Base Infrared Systems, or SIBRS, both of which are designed for the Air Force. We also lead space research and de development out of our labs in Palo Alto, and that center is called the Advanced Technology Center. So we have a really long and dedicated history to Silicon Valley. Yeah, I can clearly see. And uh, th there's a lot more to AEHF than just the satellite. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the ground systems that support it? Sure. So we're obviously all excited about the launch that just took place, and for good reason. But we also know that every satellite system needs an integrated ground system to keep it running. So Lockheed Martin, we build the mission control ground system out of our Sunnyvale, California campus. And that mission control ground segment is part of what really keeps the AEHF network running. So that segment controls mission planning and command and control. So it's a key part of that network. And there's certainly a lot of capability uh, with AEHF um, that we can all look forward to. I know there's a lot of connections to a, his a heritage uh, constellation named Milstar. Um, can you elaborate on what that connection is and what exactly is Milstar? So Milstar was AEHF's predecessor, and it was groundbreaking protected communications network in the 90s, and it's a tremendous asset still to the Air Force. Um, today's AEHF, we just saw Satellite 4 go up, it has increased capacity, flexibility, resilience, and coverage. Um, in fact, users will see up to a five times greater increase. So. The two satellites, they serve more people, they have faster data rates, and they work together. Wow, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating how technology is advancing so well. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this morning, Lori. Thank you for having me, Tyler. And with that, uh, we should be approaching Main Engine Start 2. Uh, let's listen in. We have locks pre-start on there, all 10, now standing by for ignition. And we have ignition on the all 10, chamber pressure looks good, body rates look good. And propellant utilization system has gone to closed loop control. System response looks good. Chamber pressure continues to look good on the RL-10. Vehicle body rates remain stable. This burn should last approximately 5 minutes, 54 seconds. Now passing 23 minutes into flight. This is Atlas. Atlas Mission Control at T plus 23 minutes, 18 seconds and counting. We just heard confirmation of the second main engine start. Main engine cutoff 2 is planned to occur in approximately 5 minutes. Sent our PU system controlling uh, MR as expected. Now passing 24 minutes into flight. Centaur continuing to perform well in the second burn. And just over four minutes now remaining. Centaur continuing to perform periodic thruster firings as expected. RCS line temps maintaining uh, close proximity to bottle temperatures. Uh, seeing consistent tank 
pressures on uh, LH2 and LO2, and uh, hydrazine and helium storage bottle pressures also maintaining stable values. Seeing good body rates on Centaur through this first burn. Now passing 25 minutes into flight. And just over three minutes now remaining until Miko 2. I'm back with Major Matthew Getz, and we're about to announce the answers and the winners to the game of trivia we held on Twitter shortly after liftoff of the Atlas V carrying AEHF-4. Major, are you ready to get started? Absolutely. Let's begin. Question number one was, the AEHF-4 mission is the 50th mission ULA has launched for the U.S. Air Force. What was the first mission ULA launched for the Air Force, and which rocket launched it? And the answer is... Atlas V Space Test Program 1 launch. STP-1 launched on March 8, 2007 from the same launch pad that AHF-4 blasted off from earlier this morning. Question number two was, tonight's AHF-4 mission was the 250th flight of the Centaur upper stage. When was the first Centaur flight on top of an Atlas rocket? And the answer is 1962. Congratulations to Jack203. Question number three was, over ULA's 50 launches for the U.S. Air Force, for which satellite family has ULA launched the most missions? Here's a hint. It's the only satellite family to launch on all three of ULA's rocket families. The answer is GPS, Global Positioning System. In number four, question... How, over its 250 flights, Centaur has given a boost to many exploration missions. Which planets in our solar system have Centaur missions explored? The answer is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. As a note, Pluto was a planet when New Horizons launched, but was downgraded in 2006. Congratulations to Clemensunger. What a great game of trivia. I always love playing trivia. Um, thanks so much for helping me out, Major, um, helping me announce those winners. And thanks to all of our per followers who participated in tonight's trivia game. Thanks for having me. This was fun. The Air Force has an exciting announcement, and I'll let the video we're about to show speak for itself, but I'd like to say I'm pretty excited about the opportunity the Air Force is providing. And we're now approaching main engine cutoff two. Uh, oh, we've got confirmation that it has occurred. So main engine cutoff two has occurred. I'd like to thank Patrick Moore for his support of today's coverage. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, if you'd like more additional live updates of today's mission, please go to ulalaunch.com for live blog updates about uh, 
separation of AEHF-4 and continuing events from today's flight. On behalf of the entire team here, uh, I'd like to just say thank you, and we'll finish with a live uh, another look at today's liftoff, which occurred at 12.15 a.m. Eastern. I'm Tyler Strickland, and on behalf of the entire launch team, thank you for joining us, and have a great day. Ignition, two, one, and liftoff of the AEHF-4 mission carried by United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket for the United States Air Force. Now 20 seconds in the flight. Patrick Moore, providing launch vehicle. Now passing 30 seconds in the flight. 